What's up, folks? This is Tony Brewer. You're listening to Cogitations. Cogitations is the podcast where we think about things. We contemplate them. We turn them over in our minds, and then we discuss them. Daniel chapter 7, verse 28, Daniel writes, Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me. My countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. We're not going to keep the matter in our heart. We're going to talk about it. Today, we're going to talk about these three lessons that you can learn from the shining face of Moses. Uh, We're going through the book of Exodus in our Bible class at Riverview, and I rather like this uh, this section. Um, It pairs nicely with a section from the New Testament. Sorry, I'm kind of discombobulated here. I don't know if you can notice or not. I'll get her straightened out. Anyway, uh, it pairs nicely with the scripture in the New Testament. I love the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, First and 2 Corinthians are great. Uh, they're, good, um, they're good. They're good epistles to help us with church growth and, and church maintenance. You know, they, the church in Corinth was dealing with some issues, and they're issues that are ubiquitous, I think, to just about any any group of people that, that are gathered together for a, for a common purpose. Anyway, um, Holly H. Good, good morning, everyone. Diana Harden. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, yeah. So announcement time. Uh, if you'll notice in this, in the comment section, Neil Abbott says, I was inoculated for cogitation whenever I was a kid. It happens. Um, And Terry Crooks, good morning to you. So we have a merchandise store on Shopify. The link is in the comment section. The link is also in the show notes. Uh, It's just a way for you to, uh, you you can buy merchandise. We make a small amount off of it. And it's a way to just, it's an alternative to buying branded content from, uh, retailers. I've got a cup coming in the mail. Uh, a shirt was ordered and it's been delivered to Aaron Dotson's house, but he is in South Alabama. He is not at home. So, um, we'll have in the next couple of weeks, we'll have where we can show you what some of this stuff looks like. Anyway, um, I'm kind of excited. I like the coffee mugs. They're awfully expensive though. Um, I, I, I think the, I think the base price is fine but it's the shipping that is so expensive and that's just the way it is on those mugs. I couldn't, I couldn't change it. Oh, Terry Crook says she's been fighting the flu. That's no good. I hope, I hope, I hope you're doing better, Terry. But on the other stuff on the merchandise store, the shipping is, is much more reasonable. I haven't found anything that I was looking at that, um, didn't, that, 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 that caused me to pause like, Oh wow, that shipping's crazy. It was only on the cups that it's like that. And I suppose I get it right. It's they're fragile. They're, they're hard to ship. It's hard to compress them. You can't stack very many. So I get it. But anyway, all right, let's get into the, uh, let's get into the podcast. If you'll remember, uh, this is Exodus 34. I'm just going to commence to reading it. I'm going to read from 29, uh, Verse 29 to verse 35, that's the last verse of the chapter. And Terry Crook says she feels a little bit better today. I'm, I'm proud to hear that. Scott Beck says, good morning, Tony, and all, and I, and he gives Terry some well wishes as well. All right. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them, or with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh to him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them commandment, And he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, 
he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake to the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. Now, I'm going to tell you something that is 100% in the realm of conjecture. I think it's a reasonable inference from the text. And I think maybe the reason we're told so much about Moses putting this veil on and taking it off and this, that, and the other, during this stage of the promulgation of the Mosaic Covenant, Moses was going in and out of the presence of God. And whenever he would go into the presence of God, his shining face, his countenance shining was kind of recharged. And perhaps whenever he left the presence of God, uh, you could start to see that diminish somewhat. In other words, you know, by the time Moses passed away at the end of his life, was his face shining? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think it would have been, but I could be wrong. I'm not certainly going to make a, a heel to die on. I'm not making a point of fellowship, but it, it does bring me to the first lesson that I think of whenever I think about this passage of scripture. Well, Moses descends from Mount Sinai with a face that shines from speaking with God. It's radiance in appearance, but it seems like it, it well, I know it, it fades over time. I know for a fact it fades over time because we have 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, yes, uh, it, it, absolutely. Neil Abbott, uh, Neil Abbott says, agree. It didn't hide the shine but it hid the the dis, the diminishment of the shine, and that's look that that's explicitly stated in um, first or in Second Corinthians chapter three, which we'll we'll look at that text in a moment. But think about the illustration then with us, because we're going to appropriate this a little bit. I don't think this is the main lesson to take away here. I just think that I, I I'm. I cannot help but be drawn to this as I read this text, okay? Moses, going into the presence of the Lord, the presence of the Lord changed him a little bit. In other words, you can see. Now, think about, in other words, you can see it on him, okay? Think about the illustration of a fireplace. And you have a... Hello, Brandon Wild. Good morning to you. And uh, thank you, Topo Ray. Topo Ray says, great show. So whenever I'm thinking of a fireplace, you know, I've got the wood burning, the coals and everything. You have that beautiful, I, I, look, there's something kind of pretty to me about a fire. It's this beautiful uh, coal bed, bright, shining coals. Now take the tongs and take one of those coals, this bright, glowing red, and move it onto the hearth. It won't be long that coal will lose its brightness. Now, let me tell you something. If the minute it loses its brightness, if you go and touch it, even though it is dull in appearance, you are still going to be burned. All right? But the longer it stays away from the fire, the cooler it gets. Well, that's the way we are with fellowship. That's the way we are with God. That's the way we are with our Christian brothers and sisters. We are part of a corporate church, a cooperating body. Hello, Connie Barden. It's good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. So it, it's we're, we're part of this. I mean, like it's anything. When I did that short little video about the word church being a perfectly fine translation for the word ecclesia, I talked about uh, ek kleo, uh, to call out. Incidentally, to comfort is para kleo. Para meaning beside. Kleo means to call, to call to one side. God is the father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. And he comforts us so that we might comfort people. That's second, we'll talk about second Corinthians chapter one. Anyway, <clears throat> we are, a, we're, we're part of a communal body. 
granted, yes, I know that technically if there was only one Christian in the world, the church would still be in the world, but it sure wouldn't be operating at an optimum level now, would it? Because the church is supposed to gather together. Well, how do you gather together with just one person? It's it's difficult. I think that you can meet the minimum requirements of being faithful if there's only ever one Christ, if there was only one Christian left. But you your your main goal would be share the gospel and convert people. Like we we need a group of people because we are better together, we're stronger together than we are alone. And that's that's just all there is to it. There's a corporate nature. And so anytime that you are you feel unplugged, anytime you feel like you're low energy, anytime you feel like your fire isn't burning brightly and your passion isn't burning deeply for Jesus, go hang around some people for whom that is the case. Because I promise you this this Christian light is contagious. Just like there are some people that get, that kind of act like a black hole. You know, in the in, in in outer space, you have a star that collapses in on itself and you have the singularity there and it's it's pulling everything in including light. And some people are like that. Don't be like that. Go to, well, I, I think, I think about Psalm 73. I got my marker here in Exodus. Let's go to, let's go to Psalm 73. There's this, this psalmist, he, he, he writes about a change of perspective while he's alone. He's having a hard time keeping his fire lit. Um, listen to this. True, this is Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet had almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out in fatness. They have more than the heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue worketh through the earth. Therefore is his people, therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. So these oppressors are are have a bounty. They their cup is full. But what they give other people that are oppressed, they give them only what the rag, only what can be wrung out of a rag. That's terrible. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands in innocency. Folks, this is a man that believes he's all alone. He feels like he's all alone. He is that ember that has been set aside and is being allowed to cool. He's got to he's got to get back in the fire. He's got to get back in the bed of coals. He's got to get back into the presence of God so he can resonate some of the glory of God. You see where I'm going with that? Maybe I'm making too much of it. Maybe I'm appropriating that a little too much. But it just seems so very practical to me. If we want to shine with the glory of God, if we want to reflect the glory of God and shine the light of God in a lost and dying world, we got to stay plugged into the source of the light. Hello, Gita. Good to see you. Good morning to you. <clears throat> Pardon me. Verse 14. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should defend against the generation of thy children. He, he, he knew the folly of his mental, of his thoughts here. He, he knew the folly of it. He knew this wasn't right. He knew this was, I, I believe he's singing about this, and he's singing as if it were a mental, uh, a fleeting moment, a, a moment of weakness. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went and spent time with my fellows. 
until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Folks, the psalmist had to reorient himself. As a Christian, if you feel your light going out, if you look at the world and see the darkness in the world, and the darkness of the world is sucking from you your light like a black hole, you got to go plug back into God. You got to get back with the brethren. You got to put your nose in the book and your feet with the brethren. Hello, Zenas Gill. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, love verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. That's right. And you know, sometimes the best way to feel the presence of God is to surround yourself with godly people. Think about that for a minute. Think about, like, if, if, you, if you are a Christian and you fall away, you feel your light dim. Think about how to be recharged. Think about, as trite and cliche as this sounds, think about what you would need to do if you fell out of love with your wife. Well, I mean, I'm a man. I speak, if you're a woman, think about what you would do if you fell out of love with your husband. What did you know that did you know that the formula for reconciliation of a romantic relationship is in the Bible? Check it out. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and how that's how, how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars, and has borne and, and, and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, if you're a woman, and you have left your first love as far as you've fallen out of love with your husband, or if you're a man and you've fallen out of love with your wife, if you're a Christian and you've fallen out of love with God, what do you do? It's the same formula, folks. You remember from where you are fallen, you go back and do the first works. That's it. Listen to it. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works. I did leave out the repenting, didn't I? That's, that's kind of important. <laughs> don't, don't leave out the repentance. Repentance is change your mind. So basically, be real with your current situation change your mind about your current situation and go back to doing the things that put you in the situation for which you long. If you're a husband or a wife and you've, and you've left your first love, you've fallen out of love with your spouse, be real with where you are, change your mind about where you are and go back to doing the things that cause you to fall in love in the first place. If you're a Christian and you've fallen away <clears throat> you've lost a relate. You've lost your relationship with God. You've lost your relationship with God's people. Be real about where you are. Change your mind about where you are, and go back to doing the things that got you where you want to be in the first place. That's it. We have to change our perspective, and sometimes a change in perspective. Needs to have a change in location. God, God's influences, God's influences. Well, Tony, no English. God's influence fades the longer we are away from Him. The longer we are away from someone, the more their influence fades. Absence does make the heart grow stronger in the coming together again. But that's the thing. If you stay absent for too long, there, there's nothing to go back to. You have to consider where you are, repent, and do the first works. <clears throat> so that's the first lesson that I learned from this, uh, where Moses goes before God and his face shines. Now, Neil Abbott, 
alluded to Second Corinthians. Actually, I tell you what I'm going to do. Let's read the la to finish this point. Let's read Psalm 73. All right, verse 17. We're going to finish out the chapter. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. So again, whenever you feel the light of Christ dwindle, when you feel the love of God dwindle, go back and associate yourself with people who have that light, reflect that light, and have that love. Remember, it's contagious. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou, canst, thou castest them down to, into destruction. How were they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream, when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved when I was pricked in my rain, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. He, he feels ashamed for having this mindset. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by, by my right hand. He's basically saying, God, you're more faithful than I. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If you're a, if you're a hot burning ember, that heat didn't originate with you. You better stay plugged into the, or, uh, the ori origin of the heat. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Folks, your Christian light, your love of God, all of that can be maintained much more easily if you stay plugged into the brethren. And remember, Christianity is a cooperative religion. You you can be a you can be the lone Christian on the deserted island if you've been shipwrecked on an island. You can, but it's much easier to be a Christian who is part of a faithful group. Now, mankind is more intuitive than we are credited to be. This second lesson stems from the intuitive understanding of the Israelites regarding the fading glory of Moses' face as an allegory for the fading relevance and potency of the law of Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. The Israelites could not look steadfastly at Moses' face because of its glory, Exodus 34, 35. Yet they knew that this glory was temporary. And I, I, believe, I believe the implication is there from the text. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I believe verse 13, and not as Moses, which put a veil on his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. I believe the implication there is the children of Israel could, could ascertain and understand that look. This face, this, this, the face of Moses is shining, but that face is, that glory is diminishing. So too will the glory diminish from this law that's given. Don't ask me how. I don't know exactly. I think that maybe people were a little bit more cognizant of things and, and, and were able to intuit things that we don't give them credit for. And so, as I said, I think. I'm not going to die on this hill. I'm not going to make it a fellowship issue, but I think maybe this might suggest that humans have a maybe an innate understanding of spiritual truths. In other words, we can suss these things out and we can make those, um, I believe the word is a posteriori observation. Let me make sure I've got a good definition of that. All right, a posteriori meaning. A posteriori, uh, or a, a po uh, posteriori is from the Latin, which means literally from what is later. It describes knowledge based solely on experience 
or personal observation. All right. Now, let me P R I. Let me make sure I've got. Now, a priori is from the Latin a priori, which means from what is earlier. And a priori, a knowledge is knowledge that comes from the power of reasoning based on self evident truth. Okay. See, I've, I've pivoted mid podcast. I believe that the children of Israel were able to make an a priori observation. They were able to reason out since this glory in Moses' face is diminishing, then the glory of the covenant is going to diminish as well. I, I'm not going to die on that hill, but I think that's, I think this suggests again that humans have an innate understanding of spiritual truths, even if we're not always conscious of it. Like we can recognize things and we can make those a priori reason reasonings, those observations, and we can be fairly, fairly correct, fairly accurate. What we need to do is understand that when we make a priori observations, we don't need to bind them as law. The new covenant is significantly more glorious, absolutely. Built on better promises, and it's got a better sacrifice, doesn't it, Terry? All right, so I'm not going to linger much on this. I think, man, again, mankind is more intuitive than we're credited to be. They, I think they, I think the text in First or Second Corinthians bears this out. And, in fact, I think it, it wouldn't hurt a thing for me to just read it here. Um, let's see. I'm going to go all the way back to verse 7. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of the condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, and it was, much more that which remaineth is glorious, and it is. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Folks, the new covenant is significantly more glorious than the old covenant. And if we have a mind to see it, it is self-evident, and we can reason that out, and don't have to have a direct revelation from God to be able to understand it. However, we do have a direct revelation from God, so that helps. In the Ten Commandments movie, they gave Moses gray and silver hair, and his mother, Bitha, said, This is a great light that shines from your face, Moses. Perhaps some, someday I shall come to understand it. Ha, <laughs> interesting. All right. Lesson numero three. Mankind is rather delusional. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, as long as we can't see it, it won't hurt us. <laughs> I really hate that at 46 years old, if there is a threat that I cannot see, it doesn't bother me because, you know, out of sight, out of mind. You 
human beings have a tendency to deny unpleasant realities. When Moses wore the veil to cover his face, it was a way to shield the Israelites from the truth of the fading glory of the old covenant, the covenant under which they resided. This is, again, it's, I'm not dying on this hill, but I think this can be seen as a metaphor for how people often choose to ignore or hide from plain and simple truths that are uncomfortable or challenging, especially when these truths demand a change in lifestyle or beliefs. And I think that plays out with what he says in the latter part of the text here. That verse 14, their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So they put a veil on their mind. They didn't want to come. When you read the Old Testament with an understanding of Jesus, you are knowing and it is evident that you are reading something that is winding down. It's coming to an end. I don't know about you, but I get sad when things come to an end. I know that I, from time to time, I reread uh, Robert Jordan's uh, Wheel of Time series. I've probably read that, that entire series of books 20 times in my lifetime. And uh, every time I read it, I get a little bit sad because I can see the progression of the titular, well, the overall arch, the, the character, the dragon. And it, it makes me sad because I know things are winding down. I know things are coming to an end. And as much payoff as the end of the book, Brandon Sanderson did an exquisite job finishing that book for Robert Jordan, although some people kind of unfairly criticize him. I think, I think Brandon Sanderson did a masterful job. So the payoff for the, for the reading and the story is amazing. It's immaculate. It's wonderful. But it's a sadness associated with it because it comes to an end. So when I read it, I kind of, it, it's almost like along with the suspension of disbelief, I kind of suspend rationality in my mind and like, well, this story is never coming to an end. Humans can be a little bit delusional. We can we can patch the the we can patch the plaster of the sheetrock in a in a room of a of a building that's on fire. But as long as we feel like we're doing something, we're delusional enough to feel like we're we're doing something good. And that's it. We got we got done with this way earlier. So through the narrative of Moses' shining face, we learn about the need for ongoing communion with God the Father. We learn about our intuitive grasp of spiritual truths, and we learn about our frequent denier, denial of inconvenient realities. These lessons, folks, are crucial for both understanding the nature of divine revelation and human response in spiritual matters. By reflecting on these themes, believers can aim to maintain a closer relationship with God and embrace deeper truth and confront reality that require transformation in our lives. Stay plugged in to the brethren. Whatever you do, don't be that ember that thinks that you can still burn if you are three feet away from the fire laying on the hearth. <clears throat> Don't also trust yourself a little bit. Understand that you're more intuitive, perhaps, than you've been given credit for. Understand that God has revealed the truth in his word in such a way that you absolutely can understand it. You don't need to have any kind of special degrees. You don't need to have any kind of special esoteric knowledge of particular 
things that are difficult to suss out. Just read the book. Think about it. Meditate on it. Be open to criticism for the conclusions that you draw. I know I certainly am. I've certainly been uh, open to criticism of the views that I've held over the years. And quite frankly, I've changed in some of those views. Nothing wrong with that. But understand that you don't need to go like this bookshelf behind me. We've got some commentaries and reference books and stuff like that. I'm going to tell you as much as I've, I'm appreciative of those books and whatnot. I've always said if um, if I got if I got too cold, I just burn them books because those books are nice. I like to know what intelligent men and women of the past have said, but I don't need those books to be able to understand this book. I mentioned a, a passage of scripture earlier where I said, keep your nose in the book and your feet with the brethren. Well, that's Acts 248. Hold on. Is it 242 or 248? Now I can't remember. It is 242. 248 doesn't exist. <laughs> All right. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. Folks, they kept their nose in the book. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the nose in the book. And fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayer. That's their feet with the brethren. So keep your nose in the book, keep your feet with the brethren, and then you're going to, that glory is not going to fade. And so you're going to trust your intuition more because your intuition is going to be trained by the word of God. And you're going to not be delusional. You're going to face your problems head on. You're going to face your fears head on. You're not going to operate under the assumption that, well, if it's, if I can't see it, it's not going to harm me. Folks, that's no way to live. We have to confront these things head on. We have to take the veil off of our heart. We have to be open. Scott Beck says, thank you for including Psalm 73. It's one of my favorite Psalms, as, as it is mine. And I'm telling you. All right. So every one of you that is watching, we'd love for you to hit the like button. We'd love for you to share this content on your social media platform. That helps us out. Uh, we would love for you to uh, send us a donation through PayPal. In fact, um, I usually have the tip jar up. Our PayPal is nearchurches at gmail.com. You can send us a one-time monetary donation. If you want to set up a monthly monetary donation, there's a couple of ways to do that. For one, you can do it through uh, Patreon. Where is... If you go to Patreon, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Christianity now. You can give them your information and they will set it up or they'll just take it a little as a dollar a month out of whatever you tell them to take it out of and you can set it and forget it. Um, awesome. I'm glad. Connie says, good lesson to listen to while sweeping and mopping my floors. Well, I'm glad. And then if you want to, if you want to do a monthly patreon.com forward slash Christianity now or you can opt for a paid subscription on Substack. Now, the default is free. Just go and sign up for Substack and get a free subscription. But we do offer some added value stuff where uh, we have some articles behind a paywall, and you'll be able to get access to that for $5 a month. And then, of course, um, you can just do the uh, nearchurches at gmail.com or patreon.com forward slash Christianity now. And then we have the... Uh, the merchandise store. So we would love for you to go to uh, the merchandise store. I believe um, I'll share the, I'll share the link one more time in the comment section. And you can go there and check out some of that merchandise folks. That's all we've got here. This has been Tony birth cogitations. Remember like subscribe, share, share on your social media platform. 
uh, Christianity Now streams on YouTube and Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn Radio for cogitations where you can listen to it in the background while you do those other things. God bless you. Oh, if I play a replay, will you come sweep my, my floors, Connie? <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. God bless every one of y'all, and we'll catch you 